Chapter one in the White et al. textbook is a relatively quick read. And one of the reasons it's a relatively quick read is because the text is actually quite a, an interesting and flowing narrative. The other reason is because a lot of what chapter one contains are a series of models that are presented uh, largely for the purposes of um, providing you with different examples. So let's take a quick look at uh, evidence-based practice and some of the information that we have in chapter one here. So if you're looking at pages, I guess it's three through seven. So the first three or four pages really that get you up to the evidence-based practice conceptual frameworks and models section. Here's a real short guide of what it is that you're looking at there. A couple of things that you want to note is on pages four and five when it goes through and talks about the different factors that are influencing why we should be using evidence-based practice and why we should be doing this now. At this point in the lecture, I'd actually like to turn it over to Dr. Clavo Hall and include a section of a lecture that she had recorded from a previous semester to go into some of the more detailed issues around evidence-based practice. And then we are looking at the portion of our course called evidence-based practice. And with this, we are basing our approach on evidence-based practice, but this too is not without its critics, okay? Evidence-based practice, I know that some of my students from prior classes may have seen this this diagram before and what it basically comes down to is evidence-based practice to get best practices we need to have the best research evidence and i'm going to say the best current research evidence and we need to have professional expertise and that is whichever area you have been educated in whether it be nursing um, medicine some other field, you need to include your medical training in this. And now we have to also include the client perspective. The client is also connected to the client's family. No more turning your back to the client or the, the patient and their family and discussing it among the doctor and the nurse. Okay. Now, evidence-based practice means that you have to include the client perspective. And just as an aside, Note that there is an evidence-based practice, uh, evidence-based nursing uh, website that has tools in the theoretical frameworks and toolkits for you to use. So there's evidence-based nursing practice specifically for nursing. And uh, in the side, you will see, I believe it's in your uh, White and Dudley Brown into her book, the one on translation of evidence into nursing and healthcare, that evidence-based practice has a, a medical uh, history, starting with Wachibal Cochrane. Remember the uh, the Cochrane libraries that we use now, but also it has a nursing history, going back to Florence Nightingale in the evidence-based practice that she actually conducted during the Crimean War. So evidence-based practice does have a uh, historic group in nursing as well as in medicine. So we look at evidence-based nursing actually has five steps to its process, which is similar to the nursing process that uh, also that you're familiar with. And for you, and in this program, it's paying special attention to, it's about asking the question, you are going to be starting your projects, your evidence-based practice projects, you're going to have a question. You're going to learn about, for those of you who haven't already used it, and can almost throw up at the sound of the PICO question, that you will be starting out formulating a question and that question is what's going to help you go to the library and create your literature on your topic. 
we do not uh, start by just thinking about a question. Um, usually there is a clinical assessment that helps you show which questions need to be answered in a particular environment and there's a way to document that. Then you formulate the question. You take the question to the library and start to put in your key term to do your literature search. Then you're appraising your research by reading the articles and synthesizing and analyzing what you find in the articles and looking at the validity of them and the usefulness of them. And then you look at how to apply it which goes back to your evidence-based practice, looking at the expert input, the client input, and the research input, how do you best use that information to answer your question, and then assessing your particular project by looking at the performance and evaluating it through a process of self-reflection, audits, and as well as peer assessments, and you would be using assess evaluation assessment tools also in your project. So we have a problem here. And this problem that we have in healthcare is put out by the IOM, the Institute of Medicine. And I must say, everyone doesn't agree with the IOM or Institute of Medicine, but most people do take what they say to heart. And a lot of evidence and research is built upon it. But here you have many people are not receiving evidence-based care. And that goes back to say we're doing something in our clinical practices, but can we show the research that validates why we're doing what we're doing in practice? We have as many, this is from James in 2013, as many as up to 400,000 people, patients in hospitals dying from preventable errors and adverse events. And a lot of this is um, unexplained differences in types of care. I have to tell you that you may go in to uh, a particular care facility here in California and say that I'm having pain in my upper left quadrant and the type of evaluation and care that you get when you go into a hospital here in Northern California may well be very different than the type of care that you would get when you go to Colusa County or when you go to uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, when you go to uh, Little Town, Florida. So we don't have consistent care across our medical system here in the United States. Returning to a more specific focus on Chapter 1 in the White et al. textbook. Now, another useful way, and this is more from the perspective of an organizational standpoint, is the use of models. And if you look at what White and her co-authors have to say, it starts there in the bottom of page 7, you'll see that they talk about and begin to introduce you to a series of models. And uh, throughout the remainder of the chapter, they go through and actually give you about a dozen different models that you can look at. But one of the things that they talk about is that all of the models seem to have these particular phases that are common or steps that are common to them. Now, in some cases, you'll see that each of these six steps may be broken down into further pieces. So instead of having six, there might be eight or ten there. In some cases, there might only be four steps where you can see that the model has clearly combined a couple of the steps that are here. But essentially, there are these six things that you do in each of these models. And as you can see here, I mean, they're basic ones. And if you look back and review against the, the five questions that we just asked ourselves or the five A's that we just had a second ago. You can see these evident in those. Identify a problem or a question of practice. Let's go out and actually find the best evidence that we can based upon those. And as we find that evidence, as we find that research to evaluate or to appraise that research in a critical way, 
to look at the quality of it, to look at uh, whether or not it's been replicated, the level of reliability and validity that it has as part of it. Then based upon that research to actually recommend a specific course of action that we're going to take to try to address this clinical problem or this question of practice and actually go out and, and do that intervention. So not only just recommend the action, but then go and actually do something. And as it says from, you know, the recommendation for the action, in some cases, based upon the research, we might realize that what we're doing is acceptable. What we're doing is an evidence-based best practice. So we should keep on doing that. So there'd be no change in that. Um, in other cases, we might identify areas where we should change. In some cases, we might realize that we need to do more research, that there needs to be further study on this. And that may be study that we could do, so it may be doing more of steps two and three, although it might be something that, you know, there's just not enough research in the field to answer that specific question yet. So where you need to rely upon the things that we found in the T1 and T2 aspects of that Brownson chart, where we're looking at the bench research and then the guidelines for practice that needs to happen before we can get into that T3 area, which is where this would fall. If there is something that we can do, obviously we would want to try to implement that based upon the recommendation. And then just doing it is, is not enough. We want to actually go back and determine whether or not doing that, making that change, implementing that particular intervention has actually had an effect. And if it's an effect, is it the desired effect or is it a adverse effect? And depending upon whether it is a desired or adverse effect, it may require us to go back to item number two and start the process again. In some cases, it has a desired effect, but not to the level that we were hoping to achieve. And in those kinds of situations, again, it may be appropriate to go back to item number two and work our way down the list again. But these are sort of a, a general process that you find. And depending on which of these models you look at, and again, the rest of the chapter, you know, pages eight through to the end of the chapter, I guess 22, really go through and talk about different, you know, these different models here and what they specifically look like in relation to that. And depending on the nature of the organization that you're in or the level that you are trying to influence, you'll have different models that will be more appropriate for others. For example, this particular framework actually reminds me very much of something that comes from the field of instructional design, where we'd look at any sort of problem of practice. So any time where there is a an actual performance and there's a gap between what's actually happening and the desired performance, we refer to that as, as an instructional design problem. And regardless of what type of model that you have, every single instructional design problem will basically have five basic steps to them. This analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And if you start to read through both the purpose of each of these five steps, as well as all of the individual things that you find in there, if you were to replace things like learner, with patient, and if you're to place things like teacher with caregiver, one of the things you'd find is I think you'd, you'd have a great deal of consistency between some of the things that you read in chapter one and what you see here. And much like the uh, field of evidence-based practice where there are multiple models for doing things, there are many different instructional design models that we can use. This here's a common one that you find for classroom-based interventions, things where you're trying to actually have a meaningful impact within a K-12 or higher ed classroom context, or even a corporate classroom context for that matter. Whereas this one here tends to be much more um, business oriented and oftentimes you'll see this done in like software companies and that kind of thing um, this kind of model that you have here so and the reason I mention that is because when you look at the different models that you find in the White and et al. textbook, one of the things that you want to do is what one is the most appropriate for the nature of organization that I'm working in and the 
type of change that I'm trying to enter to happen. So if you are focused upon, say, a unit and the individuals that are working in a unit, some of these models may be better than others. If you were looking at an entire ward or an entire hospital or an entire hospital system or all of the hospitals in a particular region, Different models will be more appropriate for different contexts than others. And that's one of the things that you want to keep in mind as you go about utilizing these. There's not a one-size-fits-all model here. And no model is necessarily better than the others. Just some are more appropriate to use in different situations and different contexts. The main thing that you want to take away from what you've read in chapter one. Again, it's an introductory chapter. It's giving us a way of trying to um, have a common language and a common understanding and a common background to be able to talk about translational research and, and evidence-based practice and giving us a way of thinking about it as well. So one of the things that we'll start to look at in greater detail, actually starting next week now, are some of these specific frameworks and, and what that means in terms of actually engaging in translational research. So as with previous presentations, again, if you have questions, feel free to email me or feel free to use the support and discussion forum that is available to you. And as always, I'd encourage you to use the latter, although I would welcome the former.